Well, if you have your Bibles today, which I hope you do, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, and I'm going to read the uh, first several verses of this, uh, probably today, looking around this well-known narrative of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 2. After, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came to, from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Well, what in the world are we doing talking about the wise men in January? I know some of you are thinking that right now. The trees and the decorations are down, hopefully. Christmas music is finally off the radio, 24 hours a day, and the credit card bills are even beginning to come in for some of you. But this story of the Magi of the East seeking out Jesus is right where it needs to be. Right at the time of the year, it needs to be. Especially this year at Fairview, when we're focusing on believing in Jesus and living like Jesus. Now, this is on the Christian calendar, the season of Epiphany. You may or may not know. Epiphany is really one of the oldest Christian observances in the whole Christian calendar. Only Easter is older historically that churches gathered together for worldwide to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. The next season kind of that came about was Epiphany. Epiphany means a sudden insight. Epiphany means um, all of a sudden in our minds and in our hearts, the light bulb comes on and we realize something great. And so the Christian season of Epiphany is when we remind ourselves, when we accept the miracle again, and when we worship as we realize that God has become man in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important. We're reminded because of this great miracle and what Jesus did for us on the cross, that we are to share the salvation story of Jesus with everyone in the known world. And so this is Matthew's message in the telling of the wise men who come to see Jesus. Let's look at this 
uh, wonderful, preserved, divinely inspired narrative this morning. First of all, I, I thought about this week how quickly Judah, how quickly even Bethlehem forgot or dismissed the miraculous birth of Jesus. How quick we forgot. How quick a society, a culture, a town, a country can forget the miracle of Jesus. Now, only two years have gone by, and two years have gone by as we read this account. But in these two years, it seems nobody in Bethlehem, nobody in Herod's court seems to know about Jesus or care about Jesus. It's just been a birth, maybe with some fanfare, but now all the celebration has stopped. The shepherds had spread the joyous word, the Bible says. Simeon and Anna had come out and prophesied and preached about Jesus. But yet still, as time went on, he has been forgotten. He has been pushed aside. Can it remind us sometimes about that in our own life? How Jesus can at times be, uh, can bring us to such an emotional high. At times in our life when we really need Jesus and we think about him every minute, every second. Yet we can also wake up one morning and admit and confess, I haven't thought about Jesus in a long while. Well, whether that's just the mundaneness of life, whether we think that things are going okay now and we don't need Jesus, or the miracle and the, uh, uh, the great push, the need, the desire to worship and follow him has waned. That's what had happened in Bethlehem. And so it's very interesting, but it's very critical that Matthew reminds us that after two years, it's not Israel, it's not the Jews who study the scriptures and the prophets and seek Jesus out. It's not them that are curious about this great miracle of God becoming man that's going to change all mankind because of salvation. But instead, it's who that, truth, that finally in their heart or in their mind or seek something miraculous God has done. It's magicians from afar, magi. It's spice merchants. It's foreigners. It's the despised Gentiles who see and listen to the signs of God that something great has happened, that a light has pierced our darkness, and they are the ones who come seeking the Son of God. And so they journey afar from the east to Bethlehem. And they come and they inquire of Herod, and they and Herod inquires of all the, the theologically trained priests and prophets and they quickly Herod says where is this child to be born who is this and of course they quickly know they they know the prophets well uh, when the Messiah comes when <clears throat> this great miracle occurs it'll happen in Bethlehem so the wise men are on point and with that affirmation the wise men leave Herod's palace and they go to Bethlehem to seek further exactly where this baby, Jesus, is. Isn't it curious, as the wise men leave the court to go to find Jesus, to worship Jesus, to seek the king of the Jews, to seek the Messiah, that nobody from the clergy, nobody from the official courts of Herod, if we don't even see any other citizens following them 
and going with them to see what's going to happen. There, it seems like, again, there's no interest. There's no curiosity. Uh, there's, uh, there's no feeling within their soul because you know God is asking them to believe. He's calling them to Christ, but they just don't hear it. And so the wise men, the wise men go alone. At this point, they had much more of a burning desire to know Jesus in a deeper and a personal way. It reminds us of John's words last week in the first chapter of John when he talked about Jesus coming into the world. And one of the, one of the things that he said is that Jesus came into the world and his people knew him not. His own people did not recognize him. And so God directs the wise men to the house where Jesus is. And he guides them by the same sign that they had seen far away in the east, a bright star. We don't really, there's been, oh gosh, all kinds of theories about what this bright star was, hasn't it? It doesn't really matter. I, I did recall, did you, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, anybody notice how bright the planet of Venus was in the sky a few weeks ago around Christmas? And the moon was out, and that really bright, bright, uh, what we thought was a star, and I think that was the planet Venus. And uh, that happens every now and then. But um, we don't know, but we do know that, that God put this miraculous light, he put this miraculous star in the heavens to direct mankind to his salvation, to Jesus. And I guess, you know, I, I noticed that the moon moved every day and Venus was here one time and seemed like it was over here one time, you know, the Earth's rotating. But I would imagine that today, uh, if you look up in the same sky in Africa and the same sky here, you're going to see a lot of the same stars. So I think, again, the, the people of Israel and Judah at some time are seeing this great sign. Other people around the world are seeing this. But again, it's these folk that have, <clears throat> it seems, no spiritual wealth, no spiritual guidance that God draws and seeks and directs to him. God uses all kinds of signs. God uses attention getters. God uses life lessons still today to guide us and other people to Jesus, doesn't he? God uses everything that he can to bring us to Christ. And you know, sometimes, and I think many times, God uses you to bring people to Jesus. Sometimes you are his star. Sometimes you are the one that causes people to ponder, to wonder, to seek Jesus and what he can mean for their life. And the difference there is we're not only used by God to draw people to him, but we've been given a heart, a mind, a mouth <laughs> to tell them and to help explain to them what it is they are seeking. We're to lead people to Jesus as well. But even though God uses life lessons, even though he uses signs and wonders and attention getters. Some, like the people of Jesus' early day, still miss God's great invitation. They never adhere to the sign. They never seek deeper. Some see the signs and they hear the message of Jesus and they scoff at it. They scoff at Others ignore the signs altogether 
and others just put off the cry for them to be saved for another day. Well, many will ask you, have you ever been asked in just a casual conversation, what sign were you born under? <laughs> many and millions of otherwise rational people still put some great stock in signs and signs of the stars and astrology, don't they? And probably just in fun or casual conversation, I imagine most of us here, if they say, with your birthday, what sign are you born under? You probably at least know, don't you? I'm a Pisces or a Taurus or a Sagittarius. Millions, I don't know if we do anymore, I guess we look millions more look it up on the web if they want to. But I remember uh, when I was younger, I imagine millions searched daily in their newspaper in the column to see what their future was under their sign. There was always a little place, and probably fittingly so, it was right there by the comics and the crossword puzzles. <laughs> it didn't mean a thing, but people still looked at it that maybe it would shed some light on their future. But for we as believers, but for we as Christians, we're not born again under a sign, are we? We're not born again under a superstition. We're not born again under uh, a fable. But we are born again not under a sign, but we're born again under a reality that Jesus is the Son of God and we're born under the reality of the beautiful symbol of the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's because of what Jesus would go and do on the cross that we believed and we were baptized. It is within the cross of Jesus that we were redeemed. It's in the message of the cross that we will live and that we will die in hope. And most importantly, maybe it's through the work of the cross of Jesus Christ that we will eternally conquer. We will conquer death. We will go into eternal life and we will worship Jesus. You see, God might use signs. He might use a star. He may use life circumstances, but our destiny is not to be found in any kind of earthly sign, but in the divinity of Jesus and in the cross that he died upon. It's the time when God opened his hands to embrace the whole world in love. Perhaps, I'm sure you have, heard the message or heard the little illustration, or maybe today see it in a post every now and then on Facebook or Twitter. It, it's the little thing where it said, somebody said, I asked God, how much do you love me? And God said, this is how much I loved you. Then he opened his arms and he died. That's our symbolism. That's our power. Thank God Almighty for such a favorable symbol. Thank God for such a favorable reality, the cross of Jesus Christ. And let's hope that we never become like those in the city of Jerusalem or in the region of Judea when we take it for granted, when we water it down, when we cheapen what Jesus has done for us to bring us salvation. The wise men risk, they risk travel and danger and reputation to follow God's leading and accept his invitation to behold and see 
the king of kings. And the other saying and little blip we see on greeting cards and, and we, we share with others every now and then, it's wise men and wise women still seek him today, don't they? We still seek him. And the wise men came and they came and the sign of the star rested over a house where uh, Mary and Jesus and Joseph now lived and they came in and they were so overwhelmed with the spirit that rested in that place in the spirit of the divinity of Jesus that they gave precious gifts to him and we too must as we encounter the holiness of Jesus the salvation of Jesus we must give him what's most dear to us what's most valuable to us what's most precious to us if we're going to follow him daily if we are going to live like Jesus like we'll talk a lot about coming up in Matthew, we have to give him our all. We have to turn over what's most precious. During the um, Advent season on Wednesday night, uh, Rosemary led us in a few lessons. And one uh, lesson, uh, she always showed us uh, um, an Advent video. It was by Adam Hamilton, who was teaching and he teaches from the Holy Land. It was very interesting. So I learned something that I had never known before considering the geography is that the, there is still there the ancient city of Bethlehem as it is today. Now, just a mile or two high up on the hill, and you can see it from Bethlehem, and certainly way up on that mountain, they, they can see Bethlehem below them is the Herodian palace and that is where Herod lived and reigned and so Herod's palace and Herod's rule sat high above lowly Bethlehem the earthly king Herod literally looked down on his peasant subjects he lived in luxury. <clears throat> he sold out to Rome, and his people suffered. And he also looked down, which is amazing, on the King of Kings, Jesus, the mighty King of the earth, who he thought he was, looked down. It showed the humble beginnings, the humble coming, the the emptying out, as Paul says in Philippians, of Jesus. Jesus literally emptied out all of his glory to come to save us, didn't he? Herod, what an odd setting, looking down from the glorious palace to a baby in a, a cave, a manger, and even later a simple house. You know, much of the world and many leaders and many people who find themselves or think they are themselves in great power look down on Jesus today. I think many people think they're a little bigger than their britches. They rely on their own power. They rely on their own influence. They rely on their own perceived greatness. And many an individual believes that they look down on Jesus and they think they're greater. And if you think you can live life and figure out life and save yourself, you're like Herod who looks down on Jesus. We can't control any of that. But both Herod and those of today 
and others, and maybe you and maybe me at times, we're sadly mistaken. You see, one of the main truths of this gospel Matthew is telling, this gospel of Jesus Christ, this story of salvation, this telling of the Magi coming, one of the main truths is that Jesus is coming more than just to be the king of the Jews. He's coming more to be this, the Messiah of Israel. But Jesus comes to be the Savior of of the entire world. No matter who you are, what country you're born, what your background is, this is a worldwide savior. Jesus has come, as the angel told Joseph, to save the world from their sins. In fact, John 3.16 begins with what? For God so loved the world. Not just me. Not just the Baptist. <laughs> you know, not just the U.S. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is stressed over and over again with the gospel writers, with the apostles that preached in those early days. That's the message they heard from Jesus. And Jesus and salvation, therefore, is not limited or owned by one group of people, one nation or one denomination. He's God's gift to us all. In fact, at the end of Matthew, his account of Jesus, Jesus himself gives his followers after the resurrection what we call the Great Commission. Jesus came to save the world, and where are we to go? The whole world. We are going to the high, we are to go into the entire world, discipling and baptizing in Jesus' name. <clears throat> We're not just to witness to those just like us but to everyone. And this story, interestingly enough, if you think about it, paradoxically, it points to the climax of this gospel story of Jesus Christ. What's going to come later in Matthew's gospel, he gives us a hint. Jesus later will be arrested and once again, he'll come very near and have a conversation with an earthly power like Herod, except this time his name will be Pilate. And Pilate will also have a dream. He'll have a dream to let Jesus go, that, that Jesus is innocent, that Jesus is without sin, that Jesus doesn't deserve any punishment. But he won't do it. The wise men called Jesus the king of the Jews that they came to seek. And now the soldiers will mockingly call him the king of the Jews. While they put a thorn, a crown of thorns on his head and mock him. Jesus laid in a manger that, uh, and laid in a, a little bed in a house. A humble throne for the king of kings. But on that day later, the cross will be his throne. And instead of a bright light that day of the crucifixion, when God destroys sin, the earth will turn dark as night. And earthquakes will happen. And the curtain in the temple will be torn in two. And a great miracle will occur. And just as maybe the, some of the first human beings that really realized the importance of Jesus are these magi, these magicians from the East, the first human to voice that Jesus is truly the Son of God 
as the crucifixion is happening and Jesus dies, will also be a Gentile, a Roman soldier of all people. Theologian I read some, N.T. Wright, says, to think about this story of the Magi and see within it the whole story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to ask yourself, what does the truth that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Savior of your soul, mean to you personally? And then, when you realize Jesus is your Savior, run to him as the wise men did. Believe in him. Run to him by whatever route you can get there and bring him every and the most precious gifts you can find. And the first most precious gift is yourself. Are you seeking Jesus? Are you still seeking Jesus? This very day, this very hour, this very minute, have you found him? Have you found him? Because God is putting wonders and signs. He is putting life experience. He is sending his redeemed to you to tell you about Jesus. First thing we need to do, this emphasis this year and in your life, is to believe in him. And don't be like the folk of Judah and Jerusalem. Don't be one of the ones that's so close to Jesus that you should know him, but you don't. God calls us. He still calls us to believe in him and to live like him. Let's learn from a group of guys. We don't know if there were three or not, by the way made a good song <laughs> let's learn from them and seek the son of God let's pray Lord Jesus thank you for your word <clears throat> what you experienced Lord uh, thank you for <clears throat> reminding us to seek you to believe in you find salvation in you. May we search our hearts now, Lord, and increase our belief. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.